43. The time for member statements has concluded. I just have a very short statement for the information of uh, honourable members, who would recall that on the 9th of uh, May uh, this year, Budget Day, we marked the 30th anniversary of the opening of Parliament House by Her Majesty the Queen. Of course, provisional or, or old Parliament House was the home to our Parliament for some 61 years, and the last sitting there was on the 3rd of June uh, 1988. I just thought members would be interested. Today marks the 30th anniversary of the first sitting in this House, uh, the permanent home of our national Parliament. There are a number of activities being held throughout the year. I warn the member for Lingiari. It'd be a bad thing to be thrown out on, whether you were here or not. <laughs> there are a number of activities being held throughout the year to mark the 30th anniversary. A particular note, Australian Parliament House Open Day, which is on Saturday the 6th of October. I can't think of a better way for the public to celebrate the 30th anniversary than an event that offers people the opportunity to come in and explore the building. For the information of honourable members, uh, the spring program, program, including the 30th anniversary events, is available on the Australian Parliament House website. I thank the House. Questions without notice. The Leader of the Opposition. question is to the Prime Minister. When talking about the government's handout to big business yesterday, the Finance Minister promised the moment will come when this parliament will have to revisit this proposal. Isn't it the case that no matter what this panic government does, or whoever leads it, the Australian people know that handouts are in the DNA of this government. Given that the Prime Minister is pretending to dump his signature policy to hang on to his job, when are they going to dump you? The Prime Minister has the call. For his, uh, his question about DNA. Uh, and uh, clearly he must share some of that DNA as well, because uh, only a few years ago he said cutting the company income tax rate increases domestic productivity and domestic investment. More capital, he said, means higher productivity and economic growth and leads to more jobs and higher wages. Well, Mr. Speaker, the member for Sydney. despite our political differences, it may be there's a little bit of DNA shared between us. Mr. Speaker, the reality is we took our enterprise tax plan to the election. We won the election. We were able, despite many naysayers, <coughs> to legislate that part of it that delivers lower taxes for small and medium uh, uh, companies, overwhelmingly Australian-owned family companies. That is already driving record jobs growth in our country. It's driving strong economic growth. It's driving strong economic growth, stronger than any of the biggest economies, 3.1 per cent GDP growth. And, Mr Speaker, we saw last year over 400,000 jobs created. Now that is delivering, but the reality is the iron laws of arithmetic, which everyone uh, pays attention to here, that is a... I'm glad you woke up. You're half asleep. Uh, the uh, iron laws of arithmetic dictate that we have not been able to get the rest of the plan through the Senate. We do not foresee any change in public sentiment on this matter, <clears throat> and accordingly we will not be taking the large, larger company tax cuts policy to the next election. Now, Australia needs to have competitive taxes. There is no question about that, and the time will come, no doubt, when people on the other side of the House We'll go back to reading the member for McMahon's book on that very member subject. Patterson. But the reality is, uh, in this place, we have to live with what we can work through the Senate, and this is something we have not been able to achieve. Now, in terms of tax, Mr. Speaker, it's very clear where the line is between us and Labor. Yeah. Labor wants higher taxes, we're for lower taxes. We're delivering lower taxes. La Labor wants to go after the savings of retirees. We are defending them. Labor wants Members higher energy rights. prices. The We're delivering for lower Minister energy for prices. Energy. Labor wants to have less investment. We want to have more investment. And what that means is Labor's economic policies mean less investment, fewer jobs and lower wages. That is why Labor is such a threat to the Australian economy and thousands of Australian businesses and millions of Australian families threatened by Labor's absolute reckless disregard for looking after the workers who they claim to represent. The member for Brisbane. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister outline to the House how this government is backing families 
with lower taxes and cheaper energy, including in my electorate of Brisbane. Yep. The Prime Minister has the call. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the honourable member for his question. The honourable member for Brisbane, Mr. Speaker, represents a, a metropolitan electorate with thousands of small and medium businesses, family-owned businesses. His electorate, like, like every electorate in this House, is full of enterprising Australians for whom aspiration is not a mystery, as it is to the Deputy Leader of the Labor Member Party. For lines. And we have been able to reduce taxes for millions of Australian businesses—3.3 million businesses, small and medium businesses, which employ collectively over half of the Australian private sector workforce. Now, while we believe in lower taxes, we also believe that paying tax is not optional. It's compulsory. And we've introduced and passed through this parliament, in the teeth of opposition from the Labor Party, the toughest multinational tax avoidance laws in the OECD. So we've taken on that challenge and we've delivered it, and it has returned over $7 billion of revenue into the Commonwealth's tax net as a result. It is a signal achievement and of the Treasurer to be able to get that through the parliament, and it's one of the reasons our revenues are stronger. It's one of the reasons we're able to afford our personal income tax for millions of Australians. Over four million Australians will get $530 back this current financial year, and over the whole period to 24-25, we'll see a reform that will eliminate bracket creep for 94 per cent of Australians. And Mr Speaker, we're also taking action to ensure that families have less uh, expense, less burden of expense in respect of childcare. One million Australian families will be better off by up to $1,300 a year per child as a result of our reforms. It's why we've been able to fully fund the NDIS. It's why we're able to spend record amounts, record amounts on health, on schools, and why we're able to bring 1,700 new life-saving drugs onto the pharmaceutical benefit scheme because we have the strong economy and the revenues to pay for it. And what did Labor do? They, they postponed, deferred the listing of life-saving drugs on the PBS because they didn't have the money. They'd lost control of the budget and, as a consequence, essential services were put at risk. Now, we're spending record amounts on all of those vital areas of health, education, infrastructure, and on top of that, we are starting to see our energy policies delivering lower energy prices. We're looking after Australian families. The Labor Party has long abandoned them. The Manager of Opposition Business. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. I refer to the Cabinet Handbook and reports that the childcare centres owned by the member for Dixon's Trust received over $5 million in public money. Given the member for Dixon has confirmed that he excused himself from Howard government discussions on childcare, and given Peter Credlin has confirmed that he excused himself from Abbott government discussions on childcare, did the former minister excuse himself from Turnbull government discussions on childcare? The Leader of the House on a point of order. Yes. Mr. Speaker. Hang on, just... no. The member for Wakefield. Uh, the Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Speaker, I will take that question on notice. I'll get advice from the Cabinet Secretary and I'll report back to the House as soon as I have it. The member for Goldstone. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer update the House? on the powers the government will impose to ensure big electricity companies reduce electricity prices for everyday Australians, households and businesses? And what would be the consequences for families and businesses of not implementing such measures? Just before I call the Treasurer, I'm just going to say again to the member for Wakefield, his constant conversations are preventing me hearing the questions. Uh, you know, I've tried to perform an educational role. I accept it's failed, but I'm not going to put up with it anymore. Okay, if you can't sit here quietly for the rest of question time, you better go watch it in his office. The Treasurer has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and, and I, I thank the member for his question. Um, 
electricity prices from July 1 have begun coming down. In the June quarter, the CPI data showed that they fell by 1.3 per cent, and that is the first time we had seen that for some time. First time we'd seen a real change in electricity prices since the coalition got rid of the carbon tax, which they said would never be in place, Mr. Speaker. But going forward, this is how you get electricity prices down. You put a safety net on price, as we are working and are acting to do, Mr. Speaker, a, a, a safety net on price which removes the confusion for pensioners, for householders, which says when they go to a standard offer, uh -uh, big companies can't keep it up there. It has to fall to the default price, and that means we will see savings from $183 to $416 for households, Mr. Speaker, and $561 to $1,475 for businesses, Mr. Speaker, for small and medium-sized businesses, which on this side of the house we still believe in, and on that side of the house they want to tax them out of business every single opportunity they get. But, Mr. Speaker, it's not just about putting a safety net on price. It is about the big stick. It is absolutely about the big stick, Mr. Speaker. This government knows how to take a big stick to power companies and gas companies and companies that aren't going to do the right thing by their customers or by other businesses. It was this government that changed Section 46 of the Competition Act, Mr. Speaker, in favour of small business, and it's this government that has the guts to go forward and use that big stick to keep the big energy companies in line and to make sure they do what they are doing, Mr. Speaker. Now, those opposite don't want to do that. The shadow treasurer does not want to have a power, if he was treasurer, to divest companies that do the wrong thing. The Labor Party rejects the idea of having the power as a treasurer, as a government, that where companies do the wrong thing and rip off consumers and use their vertically integrated power to actually rip off customers, this shadow treasurer wants to sit as dormant as he did when he was Minister for Immigration and, and the boats came rolling in one after the other and the costs went up. And the children went into detention, Mr. Speaker. He will be as useless as a minister for immigration, as a, a treasurer, as he was the minister for immigration, Mr. Speaker. There is no greater failure, no greater failure. But I'm sure the leader of the opposition will give it a go than the shadow treasurer was as a minister of the government. But there's a lot to compete with because there's plenty of people who sat on that side of the house who gave failure a whole new meaning, Mr Speaker, in terms of how they worked in a government that we knew was an absolute train wreck and the Australian people knew it was a train wreck and they never, ever want to go back to you. Member for Eden Monero, members on both sides. The member for Isaacs. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. I refer to reports that the childcare centres owned by the member for Dixon's Trust received over $5 million in public money. Given that having a financial interest with the Commonwealth potentially disqualifies the member for Dixon from sitting in the parliament under section 44 of the Constitution, when did the Prime Minister seek advice from the Solicitor General on whether the member is legally qualified to sit in this parliament? And will he now release that advice? The Prime Minister has the call. Again, uh, Mr Speaker, you'll understand on matters of this kind I take particular care. I will take that on notice and respond later in question time. Just before I call the member for Mayo, um, I'd like to inform the House we have joining us in the gallery this afternoon three former members of parliament, the Hon. Bob Baldwin, Mr Peter King and Mr Sandy McKenzie. On behalf of the House, I extend a very warm welcome. Members on my left, and I call the member for Mayo. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members on my left will cease interjecting. The member for Mayo has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Health Minister. In a welcome move, the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee recommended cystic. Member for Mayo will pause. Members on my left will cease interjecting. The member for Mayo is entitled to be heard. The member for Mayo has the call. 
Thank you. My question is to the Health Minister. In a welcome move, the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee recommended cystic fibrosis medication or can be to be added to the pharmaceutical benefits scheme. Minister, as you know, cystic fibrosis is a life-limiting condition. For eight-year-old Will Grew in my electorate, it means different medications every day and several weeks each year in hospital. Or can be increases the life expectancy of children and young people, but currently the medication is prohibitively expensive. Minister, would you please provide an update on when or can be will likely be listed on the PBS and therefore become available to children like Will? Thank you. The Minister for Health. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Mayo for this question. Uh, she's been very uh, sincere and long-standing in her advocacy for patients with cystic fibrosis, uh, in particular for the listing of Orcambi. And this is something which has been done across this chamber. I know that, amongst many others, the members for Morton and Lilly have also made representations, but it's not confined to them. Uh, on this side of the chamber, I've had uh, the member for Boothby, the member for Higgins, uh, the member for Forrest in particular, who has been a, a very strong uh, advocate for uh, young Connor in, uh, in her electorate. So what you say in terms of Will, what uh, she says in terms of, uh, of Connor and many others is sincerely held. I'm really delighted that uh, last Friday the PBAC announced that uh, after three previous uh, assessments. On this occasion, they had recommended the listing of Orcambi for cystic fibrosis patients. Uh, this is a medicine uh, which will be listed for uh, all patients six and above. Uh, there had been some speculation that if it were to be successful, it would only be for those 12 and above. It is, in fact, for six and above. Uh, we will move now as quickly as possible. I have already uh, asked the department to begin discussions uh, and uh, to work on the listing process with the company, and indeed I have spoken with the company myself. Uh, we did that uh, within the, uh, the first day of the announcement of the PBAC. As a guide, uh, I would indicate that uh, last year uh, we listed the drug uh, Kaleidico. Kaleidico is another cystic fibrosis drug with the same company, which involves uh, treating beautiful young children. Uh, that was uh, recommended, I believe, in January. It was announced in February uh, and it was uh, delivered in May. I think that provides a good guide, although we'll try to do, the, do it at a faster pace. And uh, we've already had a very strong and positive response from the company. Cystic fibrosis, of course, is, is a horrific condition. It can shorten the lives of so many patients. It's a nightmare uh, diagnosis for any parent and, uh, and any young child. And so to all of those parents who have advocated, I thank them for that. To all of the members in this House who have advocated, I thank them for that. Uh, along with other medicines such as uh, Kiskali for breast cancer, Spinraza for SMA, uh, and what we've done with uh, Kaleidico, we will move heaven and earth to do this as quickly as possible because I want this medicine to be in the hands of patients at the earliest possible time. The member for Ballarat. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. I refer to the principle of cabinet solidarity outlined in the cabinet handbook, which applies to all ministers. Does the minister retain enough confidence in the prime minister, his government, and its policies to remain minister? Members on both sides. The Minister for Health has the. Call. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And yes, I do. And I also believe deeply and strongly in the record of this government. And going straight to one of the differences between what this government does and Members that opposition my would do in government and what they did last time, we will list every medicine that the PBAC recommends. Let me repeat that. We will list every medicine. And you know why? A, because we believe in it, but B, because we run an economy which means that we can pay for the essential services. That is what this government has done. And let me remind the House, let me remind the House of what Labor did when they were in government. And I quote their own budget papers. Given the current fiscal environment, the listing of some medicines would be deferred until fiscal circumstances permit. But I've also done a little bit more reading because there was a Senate inquiry into Labor's policy when they were in government. 
And what the Senate inquiry found is that this decision of the then Labor government constitutes a major, unnecessary and unwelcome change in government policy. This profound and ill-considered change the in policy puts Minister at risk Minister for Health will just resume his seat. Minister for Health will resume his seat. The Manager of Opposition Business. Uh, uh, two points of order, Mr Speaker. Mm. First, in terms of direct relevance, the yep. question is about the Prime Minister and the Minister for Health hasn't mentioned him. Mm. Uh, and Secondly, it's difficult to hear him over the cheers of the government backbench <laughs> while he's talking. The, I'll just, no, the Minister for Health will actually allow me to rule on the points of order, if that's OK. Um, there's some tolerance. Um, given to the Manager of Opposition Business and the Leader of the House. That second point of order exhausts that for today. Uh, on the first uh, point of order, uh, the question also mentioned public policy, so the Minister is completely in order. Yes, I do support the Prime Minister, Minister so let me be absolutely clear. And I, said, and I support what we have Members done on my left. with record funding for health, record bulk filling, record funding for hospitals and record funding for mental health. But above all else, above all else, the fact that on their watch, on their watch, they deliberately deferred new medicines. And they did it in their own budget statement. And they did it for medicines right across the front, including schizophrenia, including IVF including endometriosis, including deep vein thrombosis, including uh, severe asthma and including chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So if you want to understand the difference between these two sides, what you see, they cannot manage the economy and therefore they cannot guarantee essential services. We can manage the economy, we have created a million jobs and we have been able to guarantee the essential services. That is the difference and it's fundamental. And what they would also do, what they would also do, is slash the rebate from the private health insurance uh, system and lead to higher out-of-pockets and a 16% increase in the cost of private health insurance. So they are health care vandals through and through. And what we have done in guaranteeing the PBS is give pa patients certainty and give patients earlier access to the medicines they deserve. The member for Wide Bay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Infrastructure and Transport. Will the Deputy Prime Minister update the House on how the government is putting downward pressure on the cost of living for Queensland families and local small businesses? Are there any risks to our plan to help families and small businesses in a regional Australia? The Deputy Prime Minister has the call. Oh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And, uh, initially, I'd like to thank you for reminding the House that uh, we've been in this uh, chamber for 30 years in this, on this particular spot. Because you know, the Australian public are also very thankful of that, because for more than half of that time there's been a Liberal Nationals government in place. And when you have a Liberal Nationals government in place, you can do things like we've been doing as far as mobile phone towers in regional areas, such as the member for Wide Bay's electorate. You can invest in mobile phone towers, and we're rolling them out. 867. I hear the member for McEwen yelling out in his peri-urban seat. In his peri-urban seat, let me tell you, Mr. Speaker, uh, mobile phone towers are important. They are important. Not one, not one mobile phone tower is delivered under Labor. And then, of course, we've got the member for Adelaide. Uh, how that double drop-off go? These are the sorts of policy failures that we saw from Labor for those six despairing years. But the member for Wide Bay understands farmers. He understands that they are doing it tough at the moment with the drought throughout Queensland, throughout Victoria and all of New South Wales. He understands uh, small businesses such as Jason and Susan Kinsellas, uh, Moffat Dale Ridge Winery and Restaurant. They're employing more people. They are benefiting from the tax cuts that we have provided. They will benefit certainly from the lower power prices that we will provide through the default price mechanism, through the ACCC, through security of investment in the power sector, and certainly through the divestiture measures. A tough cop on the beat. If, uh, if, 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 Mr. Speaker, those energy companies are going to gouge, are going to have cartel behaviour, then they will be broken up. That is, that is what we're doing as far as the energy sector is concerned. 
We're underpinning one important thing when it comes to power prices, and that is affordability. That is price, whilst maintaining security, reliability in the system. Now, the member for Wide Bay is absolutely committed to making sure that we have the infrastructure rollout across the nation, that 10-year pipeline of investment, $75 billion worth of investment, $24.5 billion member for Grainler, of new money in the May budget, $24.5 billion of new money. And it included the $800 million that we are investing in the $1 billion project, Section D, Kuroi to Kurra section, the Gympie Bypass. That will save lives. That will help truck drivers. That will help tourists. That will help people get to where they want to go sooner and safer. And that's the important policy platform when it comes to infrastructure, making sure that we invest in the infrastructure, whether it's Queensland, wherever it is. Whether it's in the member for Wide Bay's electorate, we are rolling out the in infrastructure we need. But what do we have opposite? We have a policy devoid Labor Party. That's right. They're devoid of policy. They smash small business. They stand for higher taxes. They stand for higher energy costs. The Prime Minister. I just seek to add to an answer in respect of the question about Section 44. I'm advised by the Attorney General that advice has not been sought from the Solicitor General. Thank the Prime Minister. The member for Chifley. Thank you, Speaker. Members on my left, the member for Chifley has the call. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Human Services. Uh, Minister, I refer to the principle of Cabinet solidarity outlined in the Cabinet Handbook, which applies to all ministers. Does the minister retain enough confidence in the Prime Minister, his government and its policies to remain as a minister? The Minister for Human Services has the call. Members on my left. Well, I welcome the new shadow minister to the portfolio, and the answer, of course, is yes. And, I, and it gives me an opportunity. It gives me an opportunity to go through the achievements, the achievements that we are actually doing within my portfolio of human services. Because we're managing the budget well, because we're managing the economy well, because we've created one million jobs, that means there's less people in the welfare system. That saves billions of dollars, billions of dollars over the budgetary cycle. That's allowed us to employ an extra 2,750 extra people within my department. So when you call Centrelink, you can actually get someone answering the phone within a reasonable time who can answer your question. A knowledgeable person who knows what they're doing, who can deal with your query in the way that the Australian people want and the service that they expect. Mr Speaker, I will continue to make sure that we're delivering for the Australian people within this portfolio. The Department of Human Services runs the largest call centre in the Southern Hemisphere. We take one million calls a week. When the Howard government left office, when the Howard government left office, the average call waiting time when, the, when somebody called in was 90 seconds, a minute and a half. When these guys left office in 2013, it was 12 and a half minutes. 12 and a half minutes. And that happened because they ripped 4,800 people out of the Department of Human Services. Those 5,000 people mean that when people call centrally, they couldn't get the service they need. These guys like to pretend that they care about the welfare system. They like to pretend they care about Australians who are on the welfare system, but we're the ones who are making sure they can get a job, and we're the ones who are making sure that they can get the support they need when they need it. Member for Barton, the member for Leichhardt has the call. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Will the minister update the House on how the government is ensuring Australian businesses can create jobs and invest in competitive international economy? And what are the risks of harming investment in Australian jobs by following a very different course? The Minister for Foreign Affairs. Uh, Mr Speaker, I thank the member for Leichhardt for his question and what a magnificent advocate he is for the people of North Queensland. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, Australia is a significant global economy with the 12th or 13th largest economy in the world. 
our economic growth rate at 3.1 per cent is higher than any of the G7 economies, indeed higher than New Zealand, and I welcome the Deputy Prime Minister of New Zealand here today, higher than South Korea. And over the last 12 months, we've created 300,000 new jobs. Member for Wakefield will leave under 94. Female participation is at the highest rate ever. Female participation in our workforce is at a record high. And youth unemployment is at the lowest level in six years. And, Mr. Speaker, through strong economic management, we've now turned the corner on Labor's debt and deficit. We'll be returning to surplus next year, and we have the lowest expenditure growth rate of any government in 50 years. And, Mr Speaker, that's why Australia is only one of ten economies that has retained a triple-A credit rating as rated by all the major credit agencies. Mr Speaker, I'm asked if there are any risks from a different course, and, yes, the course forecast by Labor is a threat to jobs, to our budget, to our strong economic management. Today, the Australian Labor Party voted against you know, corporate tax cuts, which Eight. means that Australia will now have the second highest corporate tax rates across 36 OECD economies. Mr Speaker, this means that there is now a unity ticket. The Socialist Coalition with the Communist Party in Portugal and the Australian Labor Party. So the Australian Labor Party and the Socialist Communist Coalition of Portugal believe in having the highest corporate tax rates in the world. Mr Speaker, the Labor Party is risking jobs because they said the Trans-Pacific Partnership was dead. That is providing jobs for Australians across this country. The Labor Party voted against the Turnbull government's multinational tax avoidance right. legislation and they the Australian did. Taxation they Office did. have confirmed America. that that law alone has meant an additional $7 billion $7 in tax billion. revenue into that? our economy yeah, that we are investing in hospital, record health and education areas. Mr Speaker, Labor stands for higher unemployment, <laughs> higher taxes, higher costs. We stand for lower taxes and more jobs. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, my question is to the Prime Minister. In December, the Prime Minister said, we can't in good conscience fail to refer anyone, whether on our side or Labor or the crossbench, to the High Court, <laughs> if it is clear there are substantial grounds for believing they are ineligible to sit in the parliament. I say this without any partisanship at all, and I would say the same thing about one of our members. Will the Prime Minister be true to his word and refer the member for Dixon to the High Court? Members on my right, the Deputy Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister will cease interjecting. The Prime Minister has the call. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the honourable member for his question. We all remember his rolled gold guarantee about his uh, dual citizen MPs and how they were able to sit in the parliament. And it took two High Court decisions for finally, finally the Labor Party to recognise that they are ineligible to sit here. Now, as far as uh, honourable members, uh, the, uh, he's referring obviously to the member for Dixon. The member for Dixon has advised me that he has legal advice that he is not in breach of section 44 uh, and uh, I have no reason, therefore, to believe that he is. The member for Benelong. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer update the House on how the release of recent data on the Australian economy demonstrates how the government's economic plan is working to drive economic growth and create jobs? Is the Treasurer aware of any different approaches to managing the economy? The member for McEwen is warned. The Treasurer has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the, the member for Benelong for his question. He'll be particularly pleased to know that the Australian economy has continued to move in the right direction. Yeah. Now, you know who said that? The Governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia. Yeah. That is the endorsement from the Reserve Bank of Australia about the direction of the Australian economy. 
The government's plan for a stronger economy is working, is working, and we're seeing that reflected in the most recent data. Today, construction in the public sector has grown for the past 12 quarters under the Turnbull government. That is the longest consecutive run of growth in over 30 years, Mr. Speaker. Over 30 years. Under this government, investments are being made in nation building infrastructure. There's a $75 billion rolling infrastructure program. Taxes are coming down. Unemployment is coming down. Uh, the number of jobs is going up. Another thing that has happened for the first time in 30 years and the last financial year is the, is the growth in employment for young people. 95,500 young people getting a job, which is why on this side of the House we come to work every day to get jobs for young people, to get small businesses growing, to ensure that we are growing economy so we can put drugs on the PBS affordable medicines for Australia, so we can make sure that hospitals can get the extra funding that they need, so we can have real needs-based funding for schools right across the country to ensure that children can get that support in their education. That's what a stronger economy does, and under this government we're getting a stronger economy, and that is enabling this government to deliver the guarant and guarantee the essential services that all Australians rely on. Now, you'd think everyone would believe this statement. I mean, the only way to ensure that there's more prosperity is to grow the economy. That seems like a pretty reasonable statement that you would all agree with. But not so the member for Batman, because she, when this happened and she was questioned about this, she said this. There's nothing to prove that that works. Nothing. Nothing. She says and disagrees with the statement, the only way to ensure that there's more prosperity is the growth of the economy. The member for Batman doesn't think that's true. The member for Batman also doesn't believe this true. She has said any reduction in the corporate tax rate is going to lead to more investment. It's going to push. She said, no, that's not true. There's no evidence anywhere in the world to prove, anywhere else in the world to prove that that is the case. Well, Mr. Speaker, we know that the Leader of the Opposition said this. Any student of Australian business and economic history since the mid-80s would know that part of Australia's success was delivered through the reduction in the company tax rate. Mr Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition thinks his backbenchers are nutty, Mr Isaacs. Speaker, that they know nothing about the Australian economy. And I think he's right. I think he's absolutely right, Mr Speaker. The Treasurer's time has concluded. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, my question is to the Prime Minister. I refer to the Prime Minister's previous answer. Has the Prime Minister read the advice that the, minister, the member for Dixon says he's relying upon? Is it as strong as the advice which said that the member for New England was eligible? And why hasn't he sought the independent advice of the Solicitor General? The Prime Minister has oh, the members Thank, on thank my the Honourable Member for his question. Uh, the I have not seen the advice of the member for Dixon. That he's, uh, he's confirmed to me that he has legal advice, but I have not seen it. I have not been provided of it with a copy of it. Uh, the, as far as the Solicitor-General is concerned, uh, the, you know, the, matter is, the matter has only arisen in uh, very recent times. We're not in possession of all of the facts relating to the uh, arrangements between the Child Care Centre and uh, uh, the member for Dixon's trust, but it is it is an issue of the eligibility for the uh, member for Dixon. He has legal advice, uh, but as I said, I have not, uh, I've, I've not read it. The member for Ford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And my question is to the Minister for Defence Industry. Will the Minister update the House on how the government is helping workers and ensuring the future of our defence industry by getting on with the job of signing contracts? And is the Minister aware of any alternatives to creating jobs and growth in defence industries. The Minister for Defence Industry. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Ford for his question. And, Mr Speaker, last week the government signed the contract with Ryan Mattel Defence Australia to build the 211 combat reconnaissance vehicles in Queensland at a cost of $5.2 billion, building our national security, arming our defence and our Australian Defence Force. And I'd like to table, Mr Speaker, this photograph actually of me and the Minister for Defence and the Prime Minister signing the contract. Uh, I'll put that into hand side, Mr Speaker, because the Labor Party would never have seen one of those, Mr Speaker. They wouldn't have seen one of those photographs. And they might like to go into the records and have a look 
at what it's like to sign a contract to actually build something in Australia using taxpayers' dollars, growing jobs, investment and infrastructure, Mr Speaker, because the Labor Party never did that. In their six years in government, Mr Speaker, they reduced spending on defence to 1.56 per cent of GDP, the lowest since 1938. So those people on that side of the House who have some passing interest in national security, when they get time, might like to come out and look at what it looks like to sign a contract that creates jobs in Queensland and Victoria and New South Wales and around the country, Mr Speaker. $5.2 billion in the acquisition phase, 55 per cent of that Australian industry content, Mr Speaker. And when that tender began, it was 5 per cent. Because of the decisions of this government, it's 55 per cent and $10 billion more in sustainment and maintenance over the life of type of the project, 70 per cent of that Australian industry content, Mr Speaker. So we are growing the defence industry in this country, we are signing the contracts and we are ensuring that companies like Hallmark Trailers who will build 800 trailers in Australia, in Queensland again, in Brisbane, as part of the trucks and trailers and modules contract that was announced recently and Varley in uh, Newcastle, Mr Speaker, and I see Jeff Phillips here from Varley, in fact, who will build a, a number of the modules for that particular project, and he's here with uh, Yoav bar Aven, the president of Raphael Israel, because today Varley and Raphael signed a joint venture to create a new company in Australia called Varley Raphael Australia to build the spike. Uh, missile here in this country for the combat reconnaissance right. vehicles, Mr. Speaker. So, as you can see, we are building throughout the economy the jobs, the investment, the infrastructure, working with companies from Israel and Germany who are doing joint ventures with Australian companies. All of that under the Labor Party would have been sent overseas because of the decisions of this government driving policy. We are making a difference to jobs in our economy in this country. The member for Hotham. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Law Enforcement and Cybersecurity. I refer to the principle of cabinet solidarity outlined in the cabinet handbook, which applies to all ministers. Does the minister retain enough confidence in the Prime Minister, his government, and its policies to remain as a minister? The Minister for Law Enforcement. The minister has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for her question. And the answer is yes, I do. Yes, I do. Now, Mr. Speaker, members on my Mr. left, Speaker, the first, the first priority of this government and this Prime Minister is to keep all Australians safe and secure. And I strongly support that priority. I strongly support that priority. And, Mr. Speaker, the member for since Rankin. 2013, this government has provided unprecedented funding and support in legislation uh, and money for our law enforcement agencies. Unprecedented. We have invested $160 million into our national anti-gang squad. And we know gangs have been running rampant in parts of Australia, the for including, the Labor State of Victoria, including the Labor State of Victoria. Mr Speaker, we have established Task Force Blaze. And Task Force Blaze has intercepted 19.7 tonnes of narcotics uh, before it got to our borders. Now, Mr. Speaker, 19.7 tonnes of narcotics would wreak havoc, would wreak absolute havoc in our communities, in our suburbs, on our streets. And I think everyone on both sides of the house should be enormously appreciative of the strong work that's been done by our law enforcement agencies to intercept those Member sorts of Chifley. narcotics from getting into Australia. Mr Speaker, we have committed $70 million to establish the Australian Centre to combat child exploitation. And again, again, I'm sure all members of this parliament can support a government that spends $70 million on these heinous, heinous, preventing these heinous, heinous Offences, and of course, we've announced approximately $120 million under the Safer Communities Fund and the Safer Streets Program. Now, Mr. Speaker, there is an alternative. There is an alternative 
and we saw we saw Labor Members on raid the accounts of our law enforcement agencies when they were in government. When you had a faltering budget, you raided the accounts of our law enforcement agencies in this asked their country. Question. $128 million from the Australian Federal Police, $735 million and 700 people from customs. Labor is also opposing our legislation to introduce mandatory minimum sentencing for firearms trafficking and the worst child sex offenders. Mr Speaker, you can rely on this side of the House, on this government, to keep Australians safe and secure. The member for more. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Small and Family Businesses, the Workplace and Deregulation. Will the Minister update the House on how lower taxes support small businesses to invest and grow? What are the risks for small and family businesses of a higher taxing approach? The Minister for Small and Family Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the always dapper member for more for his uh, his question. And I I acknowledge yes, sartorial elegance, as the uh, deputy prime minister points out. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I acknowledge that the uh, premise of the question is simple. What do we believe on this side of the house? The people best placed to spend the profits of their small or family business are those that actually run their small and family business. Already under the Prime Minister and the Treasurer's Enterprise Tax Plan, there are three million small and family businesses enjoying tax relief, legislated tax cuts. In the member for Moore's uh, state of Western Australia, some 250,000, in fact in his seat, some 15,000 small and family businesses enjoying the tax cuts. What do these amount to, uh, Mr Speaker? Around $3,000 for businesses under $2 million in turnover, around $3,000 of their money that they are keeping and reinvesting like small and family business operators have done historically and will do into the future in this country back in their business, growing their business and employing more people. It's how the employment numbers are generated at the coalface in small and family business land, Mr Speaker. It's record jobs growth that is driven off the back of it. And I'm asked, Mr Speaker, what are the alternatives? The alternative is to place the hands of the, of the economy in the hands of an L plater like the Leader of the Opposition. He has no real-world experience, has never operated a business in his life, has never put his hand in his own pocket, put his family's home on the line. In fact, in fact Mr Speaker, he has actively, since coming to Parliament, fought against those that do. Mr Speaker, small and family business operators, the reality is, in the last 12 months when Labor were last in charge of the economy, 60,000 small and family businesses in this country closed. In the last six years that they were in charge of this economy, between 2007 and 2013, there were 520,000 jobs lost in small and family businesses. Compare the pair. You've got on this side of the House tax policy that has been decreased to today and decreasing to 2025-26, where business up to $50 million in turnover. $50 million in turnover will be allowed under the Coalition's policies to keep more of their hard-earned profits. What will they do, Mr Speaker? They will reinvest in their businesses, as they have always done. They will reinvest in their businesses, back themselves and employ more people, and employ back in supply chains in the local economy. Let's not forget, businesses don't exist in a vacuum. Businesses of all sizes, in fact irrespective of size, Mr Speaker, interact with each other in supply chains, generating local local profits and local jobs. The, the difference is clear, Mr Speaker. On this side of the House, we will stand and fight for small and family businesses day in, day out. The other side will absolutely do nothing for them. The member for Parramatta. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Citizenship. I refer to the principle of Cabinet solidarity outlined in the Cabinet Handbook, which applies to all ministers. Does the minister retain enough confidence in the Prime Minister, his government and its policies to remain as a minister? The Minister for Citizenship has the call. Well, can I thank the member for her question? And I have given the Prime Minister my assurance that he has my support as leader. And I've also given him my assurance 
that he has my support for Members keeping on our left. borders secure. Because, Mr. Mr. Speaker, in the last few decades, the greatest policy failure that we have seen from any Australian government has been the dismantling of Australia's successful border protection system that the Howard government put in place. And we saw 1,200 boats, 1,200 people drown at sea. We saw thousands of boats arrive. We saw 50,000 unlawful arrivals, Mr. De Mr. Speaker. And we had to put that back into place, piece by piece, which we successfully did. And we maintain absolutely that commitment to our strong border for protection Braden. regime. And we will resist any efforts from the opposition, Mr. Speaker, to return to their previous policies un of unwinding those policies. We also, Mr Speaker, I have given the assurance that we will absolutely ensure that we will continue to ensure that we create jobs and prioritise Australians for those jobs. Because again, under the previous regime, the, this Leader of the Opposition, when he was the Employment Services Minister, he had the world record number of 457 visas issued. At the same time, mind you, that the welfare queues were ballooning out and the number of jobs actually declined. And Mr Speaker, um, in, in contrast, since we have been in government, we've halved the number of those types of visas That's in right. the country, we've grown jobs by 400,000, right. and we've got, the short, we've got the lowest number of people on the welfare queues right. in 25 years. That's the type of record which we have, Mr Speaker. We've got more Australians in jobs, and we take in people from overseas only when they are needed because there aren't Member those jobs available. And Mr Speaker, I will ensure that we will continue to keep our taxes low and work with the Prime Minister and the Cabinet to keep the taxes low. And we do not want taxes, as the opposition does, on investments. We don't want high taxes on small business. We don't want high taxes on property. We don't want higher taxes on retirees. And we certainly don't want higher taxes, as some of the unions are suggesting, on, on, we don't want death taxes, as some of the unions are suggesting, and you just might keep an eye on that in terms of where the Labor Party goes, because when the unions start talking about a particular policy, it doesn't take long for the Labor Party to adopt that policy, for Bill to start acting, as the Deputy Prime Minister says, and enact that policy. They're the types of policies which I support, uh, Mr Speaker, and they're the types of policies I will continue to support. The member for Barara. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister for Revenue and Financial Services. Will the Minister update the House on how the government is ensuring the integrity of the tax system? Is the Minister aware of any different suggestions regarding taxation? The members for Whitlam and Shortland will cease interjecting. The member for Gilmore will cease giving me advice. The Minister for Revenue and Financial Services has the call. I thank the member for the member for, for his... will leave under 94A. A popular choice. I thank the member for Barara for his question, and uh, I'd like to congratulate him on the hard work and advocacy that each and every day he displays on behalf of his constituents. And he's absolutely right to ask about taxation policy, because he recognises, like all of us on this side of the chamber, that people work hard for their money. And because they work hard for their money, they ought to keep as much of it as humanly possible after we guarantee the essential services that Australians rely on. But he also understands that we need a taxation system that has real integrity. We've heard a lot of hot air from those opposite, a lot of coulda, shoulda, woulda when it comes to multinational tax avoidance. And when the Leader of the Opposition was on the Treasury benches, all of that hot air amounted to absolutely nothing. It has taken a coalition government, the Turnbull government, to actually deliver, to close those tax loopholes for multinational companies and to crack down on tax cheats. We are the ones who have introduced the diverted profits tax. We have doubled the penalties for tax avoidance schemes, and we have put in place the multinational anti-avoidance law. And it's not lost on anybody in here or those who might be watching that it was those opposite, those opposite that voted against it. A law, a law that has seen an additional seven billion dollars 
in sales tax returned each and every year as a result of those changes, plus the hundreds of thousands of dollars we have seen returned in GST revenue as well. We have also established the Tax Avoidance Task Force, which in just two years has seen $10 billion in tax liabilities against large corporates and high net worth individuals also returned. And just last week we have been able to pass in this place the OE and just last week we legislated in this place the OECD multilateral convention, further bolstering the integrity of our taxation system. This means that we on this side of the chamber are making sure we have a taxation system that is secure and it allows us to be able to provide tax relief to those hard working Australians, the mum and dads out there who work hard each and every day for their income. We have legislated a personal income tax plan through both houses of this particular chamber. We have been able to legislate that that has seen 94 per cent of all individuals who pay tax pay no more than 32 and a half cents in the dollar. We have been able to provide tax relief for small and medium-sized enterprises with a turnover of less than $50 million, but those opposite would simply seek to hike up taxes $200 billion The more. Minister's time has concluded. The member for Blacksland. Thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Trade Minister. I refer to the principle of Cabinet solidarity outlined in the Cabinet Handbook, which applies to all ministers. Does the minister retain enough confidence in the Prime Minister, his government and its policies to remain as a minister? The Minister for Trade and Investment. Members on my left, the member for Grindler. The minister has a call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It's been 916 days since I was sworn in as the Trade Minister, and for the first time the Shadow Trade Minister has taken some interest in trade. Well, congratulations. 916 days later, you've finally found your voice on trade. But let me put it in terms so that even the member for McEwen and the rest of the Australian Labor Party can understand. Yes. But let's talk about the Australian people. The Australian people retain no confidence in the Australian Labor Party, and the reason the Australian people have no confidence in the Australian Labor Party is because they know what they've got planned when the next election comes. Member the Man. Australian Labor Party is going to impose an extra $200 billion worth of taxes on the Australian people. The Australian Labor Party is going to put a retirees tax in place. The Australian Labor Party is going to bring the back an emissions trading scheme. Minister, will scheme. resume his seat or just take a seat for a second, whichever is easier. The Manager of Opposition Business on a point of order. On direct relevance, Mr Speaker, the question is about his support for the Prime Minister. If he can't speak for it on three minutes, he doesn't need to make the full time. The Manager of Opposition Business is welcome to give guidance through a point of order, but uh, as I pointed out in reference to earlier questions, the question had a number of elements to it, including uh, in relation to policy, and I think the minister is quite in order. The minister has the call. The minister. <laughs> so, Mr. Speaker, let me make it very clear again, because obviously the Labor Party can't keep up. The answer is yes, and so let me make it very, very clear. Yes, of course, there's confidence. Yes, of course. How much clearer can I make it? But I make the point as well, though that there is no confidence among the Australian people in the plan that the Australian Labor Party has. Because we know, as the Australian people know, that when push comes to shove, they will have a choice about the future direction of this country. And the future direction will be between, will be between a higher taxing, big spending Australian Labor Party or a lower taxing government that's made sure that we're creating jobs, creating economic growth and delivering a stronger and more prosperous future for the people of Australia. The member for Kalea. My question is to the Minister for Regional Development, Territories and Local Government. Will the Minister update the House on how the Government is supporting our rural communities doing it tough with drought biting hard, and what are the risks for rural communities of not providing this support? Good question. The Minister for Regional Development has the call. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Clare for his question, because he, like uh, everyone on this side of the House, understands the importance 
of backing regional communities doing it tough in this terrible drought. We are helping them through. The coalition is committed to helping farmers and graziers through the entire $1.8 billion drought package that we have announced to date. We're helping their local communities as well, Mr Speaker, and as Minister for Regional Development and Local Government, I'm proud to be part of the effort focused particularly on the Drought Communities Program. Some $75 million to deliver immediate support to the 60 worst affected uh, councils, uh, council communities, local government areas across Queensland, New South Wales and, of course, Victoria. Support of $1 million each, each out to those first uh, instance of 60 councils, with more to come, including, of course, the shires of Blaney, Cabon, Midwest and Regional and Oberon and the members' own electorate of Calais. The Drought Communities Program gives councils, particularly Mr Speaker, the flexibility to choose the projects that meet local uh, community uh, imperatives. Local leaders making local decisions is what we want to get behind in these tough times. Now, we know their focus is going to be on boosting local projects, local jobs, employing local tradies, local infrastructure that uh, will support, at the end of the day, local families. And I know members on this side of the House want to do that throughout regional Australia, particularly in these tough times. I note uh, that some on the other side are obviously not interested in those doing it tough in drought. Now, through the Drought Communities Program, we're already backing 124 specific projects across 23 council areas, and this latest $75 million boost. Mr Speaker, will deliver hundreds and hundreds of more projects. So we're backing these communities. We are backing them through the Drought Communities Program. We are backing them through tax relief. We are backing them through more jobs, quite obviously, and most especially we are backing them through more trade deals and opportunities. Backing them through the Building Better Regions Fund. Backing them with, with uh, more jobs through those projects in local communities. Now, we've spent a fair bit of time in regional Queensland, uh, regional uh, New South Wales and Victoria, right across the country, and we will do more to support these communities, because without support They'll lose families, they'll lose children at local schools, they might lose a teacher or two. We must support those local uh, economies and we will do that. Towns like Blaney, Golgong, of course Oberon, Molong, we will do it in Calaire, we will do it through drought affected communities the right across has the country. Concluded. The member for McMahon has the call. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Today, the member for Dixon proposed changing the GST on energy bills, a policy the Treasurer called a budget blower, an absolute budget blower. Can the Treasurer confirm that if the states lose billions of dollars in revenue from the change in the GST, there is a real risk that they will have to cut spending on schools and hospitals as a result? The Treasurer has the call. Mr Speaker, as I noted at the press conference, that, that is not the government's policy, and it would have the impact. It is not the government's policy, and a policy that you know for the GST that affects the race or the bait requires the agreement of all states and territories. The uh, Parliamentary Budget Office has costed a similar proposal. It's about $7.5 billion over four years, and that $7.5 billion would either not then go to the states or the Commonwealth would have to pay that additional money to the states. So that answers the member's question on the issue of tax. Let me also say on the issue of tax that today the Labor Party voted to keep the big banks, which we offered to take out of the enterprise tax plan, they voted to keep them in. Members they on my left. Keep them in. Now, this is the shadow treasurer. Members this is the shadow on my left. treasurer. It's true. It's true. It's true. Mr. Speaker, the shadow treasurer once said how important it was to reduce company taxes. He put it in a book called Hearts of Minds. Well, I know what the sequel is. Feet and mouths, Mr Speaker, because he's now turning back on every single thing he said he once believed in. I'll tell you what I believe. I'll tell you what the Prime Minister believes. We believe that Australians should keep more of what they earn. We believe 
that Australians who have a go should get a fair go, Mr. Speaker, and shouldn't have to pay the more than $200 billion in higher taxes that that shadow treasurer wants to ram down their throat, Mr. Speaker. We don't believe that this Leader of the Opposition should put his hands in the pockets of retirees and pensioners. Indeed, today, the member for Mr. Lilly. Speaker, today, Mr. Speaker, we said that the energy supplement will be restored to all new applicants, Mr Speaker. Now, they scoffed. They had it in their budget costings at the last election to remove it, and they've never, ever produced another document to change their costings. They went to the last election, they said, oh, they're going to take it off, and then they adopted the same policy, Mr Speaker. There is so much hypocrisy when it comes to the Labor Party, Mr Tax, but when it comes to the issue of belief in ensuring that Australians who work hard and want to get ahead, they haven't got a clue, Mr. Speaker. All the beliefs they once stood for, they have abandoned. This Leader of the Opposition believes in nothing but himself. The member for Fisher has the call. My question is to David. the Attorney General. Will the Attorney General update the House on how the government is working to protect all Australians from online harassment? and how these measures are providing multiple avenues of redress for victims of image-based abuse. The Attorney General has Thank you, call. Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for Fisher for the question. I know that he's been an unwavering advocate for reform in this area, as, as has been the member for Forrest. So I congratulate them both for their assistance with my office. I mean, the very sad fact is that publication of intimate images is a problem that's being faced by, a very sadly, an increasing number of Australians, particularly women and girls. A recent RMIT report noted that one in five Australians, one in two Australians with a disability and one in two Indigenous Australians have been the victim of this very terrible behaviour. It's self-evidently degrading, it's humiliating, it is very unfortunately on the rise, and when victims have their say on this behaviour, they describe how it can leave a very, very terrible and lasting damage for them personally. Now, as a first step, the Coalition launched the eSafety Officers Portal, which essentially was designed to provide all the assistance that we could through the Office of eSafety Commissioner to people who'd experienced this behaviour to try and have the material taken down. Notably, 70 per cent of the reports and of, uh, to date concern female victims and 33 per cent of the reports concern victims who are under the age of 18. That, that portal had 150,000 visitors in 12 months. That indicated to us that more needed to be done. So the next step was that we went through an online consultation and public consultation process, effectively to test the desirability and viability, viability of a civil penalty regime. One thing that was very notable, Mr. Speaker, was that the central concern of people who had experienced this terrible behaviour was that there would be a regime in place that could compel the taking down of these images in real and fast time. So the bill that passed this place last week gave the eSafety Commissioner powers to issue what will be known as removal notices to compel websites and social media, uh, social media providers to take down these images. So it's, it's our Prime Minister who, amongst many other achievements, has provided for the first ever Australian aid regime which gives victims timely, <coughs> accessible and effective means to remove the private images from public view, thereby reducing the distress and damage to the victims. And that is something that should have happened prior to this point, but it's the Prime Minister who has actually made it happen. And we congratulate him Member for, for doing that. The other thing that has happened in this bill is that there are now two new dedicated offences to the online provision and sharing in a way meant to harass of what is defined as private sexual material. So we have the civil penalty regime and these two new offences. The first offence will carry a maximum of five years, and that's when the general harassment offence mm. involves private sexual material. The second offence has a maximum yeah, of seven yeah. years and applies where someone has been the subject of three civil penalties. This fundamentally changed the legal system around these offences. And if I might note, these are the sort of things that are very good to speak about in this House, because it provides all of us with an opportunity to send a message that this sort of behaviour is not a joke. It is seriously damaging and it is seriously criminal, and now for the first the time the subject time of serious criminal has penalties. Concluded. The member for McMahon. Thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. I refer to the principle of Cabinet solidarity outlined in the Cabinet Handbook, which applies to all ministers. Is the Treasurer aware of conflicting media reports of the Treasurer's loyalty 
with the Treasurer reportedly doing the numbers for the Prime Minister and the member for Dixon and himself. <laughs> Does the Treasurer retain enough confidence in the Prime Minister, the Government and its policies to remain as Treasurer? Treasurer has the call. Absolutely, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister has always enjoyed my support, Mr Speaker, and I'll tell you why. Because members together, on my left, as a, as to, together as a team, the Prime Minister and I have ensured that we have turned the corner on debt. We are bringing the budget back into balance. We have together been stewarding economic policies that have seen the single greatest increase in employment, Mr. Speaker, on economic record in this country for jobs. We have seen young people getting the jobs. We have seen our infrastructure program hitting the ground. Our plan for a stronger economy is getting the results that we want it to get. And, Mr Speaker, we have retained the AAA credit rating under great stress and strain, one of ten countries only to do so, and we have got plans to do even more. Plans to do even more, Mr Speaker, to ensure that Australians can continue to enjoy the prosperity and the stability that they rely on so the essential services that they depend on can be delivered and can be guaranteed. This government, the Turnbull government, has a plan for a stronger economy. The Turnbull government has a plan for a safe Australia, and we're delivering on that plan. The Leader of the Opposition and the Labor Party couldn't find an economic policy if their life depended on it, Mr Speaker. They have abandoned all beliefs, all beliefs, all beliefs, Mr Speaker. And they, ask, they, they interject about company taxes, Mr Speaker. We believe taxes should be lower for all businesses, Mr Speaker. We believe it. You used to say it on the other side of the House, and you allowed yourselves to be the victims of populism and walk away from orthodox economic policy. We haven't. We believe it's good for the economy. We believe that Australians who earn more should keep more. We believe Australians who run businesses should be able to keep more of what they earn. What does the Labor Party believe, other than to put their hands deeper and deeper and deeper into the pockets of Australians, take more of their hard-earned, and for what purpose? To employ more public servants in Canberra and to spray more money all around the country to puff their chest up at conferences and not get any results, Mr Speaker. We are a responsible government that is managing the finances of this country in a responsible way to deliver for all Australians. And we've got plans to do just so much more, and we will. The member for Fairfax. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And my question is to the Minister for Human Services. Will the minister update the House on the government's commitment to improving access to the essential services that Australians rely on? And how would a different approach hurt everyday Australian families? The Minister for Human Services. Well, can I thank the member for that question? And the Turnbull government is delivering on our commitment to improve customer service at Centrelink through the announcement that I recently made about an extra 1,500 staff to complement my department's workforce. Now, these staff are on top of the 1,000 staff that I already announced in April, and the 250 who we employed last year who are already responsible for very significant improvements in our service. Now, Centrelink answer about 1 million calls a week, 1 million calls a week, and clearly with that high volume, getting through can be difficult during periods of high demand. Now, our investment in this extra 2,750 staff will greatly enhance our ability to answer more calls, improve application processing times and improve overall service delivery, enabling us to better provide the essential services that the Australian people need. Now, these new staff are going to be based in call centres all around the country, providing local jobs for local workers. Call centres in Adelaide, Melbourne, Brisbane and Perth. And it will mean that the service we deliver for the Australian people is now more in line with their expectations. Now, Mr Speaker, I was asked by the member for Fairfax about alternative approaches. And our approach, of course, is to make sure that Centrelink and the Department of Human Services has the resources that they need to actually do the job. It's an enormous service delivery network, and five million Australians rely on it for their standard of living. Now, when we've been in office, I've announced 2,750 extra staff to help that service delivery process. When Labor were in office, in their last three years, between 2010 and 2013, 
They cut 4,800 people from the department. 4,800 people. And that meant we saw blowouts in processing times, we saw blowouts in our call centres, where it went from 90 seconds when the Labor Party came to office to 12 and a half minutes by the time they left. Now we're going to clean up that mess, and we're doing it by making sure that the staff are there to answer the phone calls. And the extra staff, the 250 extra staff we've employed, which is the first cohort of staff that I've announced, have already answered more than 2 million phone calls, and that's helped reduce busy signals by 20 per cent. And of course, busy signals are the most frustrating part uh, of our telephone service if you can't get through. Now, we'll continue to put on extra workforce, an extra 2,500 that will be coming on toward, uh, over the course of this year, because we are committed to making sure that the services we offer are in line with the Australian people's expectations and that we can deliver the welfare system in a timely and efficient manner. The Prime Minister. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Thank the Prime Minister.